Thank you so much, uh, Nellie and Max and the Shoplin Foundation and all of you who are here. Um, I am a, an Americanist, so it is my first real uh, interaction and sharing with uh, across the Atlantic, and I really look forward to this being the first of many collaborations as we build a anti-monopoly, pluralistic human movement. And I really appreciate David's very human <laughs> uh, introduction and welcoming to remember that this is about the thriving of uh, the human spirit, freedom, and health. <laughs> Over the last 40 years, we have engineered an anti-democratic corporate revolution that has been largely politically invisible and led to a system that is designed to both create and entrench corruption at the national and transnational level. And my talk is going to focus, as I'm an anti-corruption activist and writer, on anti-monopoly and anti-corruption and how the two are intimately bound together. So over the last 11 years, just looking at the tail end of this revolution, we have allowed over 500,000 mergers globally. And once you start to see a merger the way that Shakespeare might see a merger between families as a political moment, not an economic moment, you can see the scope of this political revolution. And even as our anti-monopoly movement has started, we have continued to allow the amassing of political power while attempting to regulate some of the behavior of these political giants. Google, which has bought over 230 companies that we have allowed, our laws have waved through. We have to not see this in a naturalist sense. It has not naturally grown, but we have signed off on, our political agencies have approved this amassing of power. We just recently waved through the Google Fitbit merger, allowing an even more intrusive view into the citizens of the world that they will use to inspect, direct our lives, and direct our politics. Bayer, Amazon, Google, uh, AT&T, Aldi, Lido, am I saying it right? <laughs> These all represent political phenomenons, not just economic phenomenons. And we know this, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, is when Werner Baumann makes a decision about crop rotations. He is governing farmers, not merely acting in a separate economic sphere. They regulate, they tax, they extract, they fund foundations, they fund lobbyists, they embed themselves in enforcement agencies and build moats around their power using predatory pricing and killer acquisitions to prevent any serious competitors from taking over their political power just as other political actors do so. So if I persuade you of anything today, my goal is that anti-monopoly is one of the most important anti-corruption tools that is underused and under-recognized uh, as a key anti-corruption uh, tool. Most of anti-corruption work, which again is where I have spent uh, the, the formative part of my career, <laughs> is running around trying to stop global corporations that have already amassed their power <laughs> from using that power in a few very limited ways. <laughs> After having acquired those 230 companies, we tell Google, you cannot directly fund campaigns for uh, uh, candidates' uh, elections. 
But this is a tr not trivial, though, and those anti-corruption efforts are really important. But it's a strange kind of failure to not go at the root of power as opposed to the incidence of power. <laughs> So I, when I talk about corruption, I use corruption in the traditional sense. And by traditional, I mean Aristotelian sense, so pretty traditional. Only 2,000 years worth of usage, uh, which is the use of public power for private and self selfish ends. So corruption then, and, and forgive me for this, you know, I'm an academic, but I think, this, I think this has real consequences for how we see the world. So there's two then key components. One is public power, and the other is the use for private and selfish ends. So when Aristotle was talking about the difference between a tyranny and a monarchy, he said, a tyrant is a king who pursues his own good, whereas a monarch is a, a king who pursues the public good. An oligarchy is elites who pursue selfish ends when they are in power. <laughs> And an aristocracy is that, that that pursues the public good. And so that means there's two key features of a corrupt system. One is that it be public power, governing power. And the other is that it be selfish ends. And so the implication of this framework is that private actors who we think of since the 19, really since the 1960s, it's a very modern um, view, uh, neoliberal view is that private actors engage in public corruption when they wield governing power selfishly. So in the, 19, in the United States, which is where I'm most familiar, this was really run of the mill. Everybody understood that a, corrupt, that a, that a corporation could itself be corrupt, not just corrupting, if that makes sense that it was itself wielding public power. There was a grant of the public power in the form of the corporation. And then there was the ability to control, to govern. You see this in our Supreme Court justices talking about the governing power of corporations. And our Supreme Court justices talking about corporations themselves being corrupt. So there's a, just a basic background non-formal understanding of power. That when you see power that can control, set terms, direct, that's governing power, whether you call it the mayor or whether you call it uh, the CEO. And then in the mid-century, a weird kind of formalism took over where corruption became associated with formal elected offices or formal appointed offices as opposed to power. Now this happens a few years before, but approximately the same time as you see the Chicago School efficiency model of antitrust takeover, where uh, antitrust is seen only through an efficiency and a consumer welfare lens. There's a medical condition called hemispatial neglect. Hemispatial neglect is a neuropsychological condition where when damage to one hemisphere of the brain is sustained, the person is unable to perceive stimuli on the other side of the body. I steal this shamelessly from the political philosopher Elizabeth Anderson who says that since the mid-1960s, we've been living in a case state of hemispatial neglect. <laughs> that antitrust can't see political power and the anti-corruption movement, she was actually using it in a different context, but I'm stealing it shamelessly. <laughs> and the anti-corruption can't see um, economic power. And I've experienced this as an academic where I go to antitrust conferences and say, there's a real political problem. And the economists will pat me very gently on the shoulder and say, that's right. There's a very, very significant problem with corporate power and politics. And it is not our problem. The anti-corruption people do that. And then I go to the anti-corruption conference and say, when's the antitrust panel? 
And they say, that seems very important, but we don't know anything about corporate power. We just know about elections and campaign finance and lobbying, so let those other antitrust people deal with this. And so instead, we've allowed by the neglect, the hemispatial neglect in both fields, we've allowed for this total atrophying of a central anti-corruption tool and a central uh, tool for economic thriving. And uh, last time I was here actually was for a TI conference, Transparency International, so I'm gonna call them out for an example of this weird formalism. Uh, and invite them, as David did, invite them to the anti-monopoly uh, fight. Uh, that TI's definition is the abuse of entrusted, of corruption is the abuse of entrusted power for private gain. But then in practice, the entrusted power is not typically applied to call out and say, not Monsanto is corrupting, but Monsanto is corrupt. Bayer is not corrupting, but Bayer is corrupt. To understand that we have actually built a system designed in Aristotelian terms for corruption. Because by definition, the corporations are gonna act in a selfish and greedy way. That part of the equation isn't hard, right? We know they are, we built them to. So we build a selfish power and then grant it governing power. We have built a system of um, corruption. So as I said before, this may sound like a trivial academic error, but this weird formalism, this failure to see the world accurately has really allowed for this anti-democratic revolution that has coincided with the celebration of democratic um, expanse. So the way that I see it is there's two ways to look at uh, uh, monopoly and corruption. One is the indirect corruption and the other is the direct form of corruption. What I've just been talking about is the direct form of corruption. So when Bayer Monsanto, for instance, regulates um, crop treatment, and I, it's clearly a form of regulation. They talk to scientists, they engage, they engage in a five-year study about how they want to, uh, how they want farmers to spray their crops. They then enforce this form of crop treatment through their market power. When they engage in that and when documents are later revealed that in their regulatory analysis, they knew the disaster that would result. Um, to the uh, new edition, there was a recent, there's basically a weekly expose, uh, but there was a recent expose about, uh, about uh, Bayer Monsanto's efforts here. That is clearly a form of governing power because they have the power to directly impact what farmers do. That's governing power. It's regulatory because they're going through a regulatory process. It is undoubtedly selfish. It's all about the bottom line. It's an example, not just of bad behavior, but of corrupt behavior. So that's what I mean by direct corruption. And then there is the indirect form of corruption, which is also extremely insidious. The indirect forms are paying candidates for office, lobbying, uh, embedding, uh, uh, ways of thinking and facts, lobbying the uh, media environment, smearing the reputation of scientists, which again, uh, Bayer and Monsanto are, are known to do, threatening regulators, and directly paying academics. And in the antitrust world, one of the most insidious indirect forms of corruption has been the paying of economists. Um, I was at a conference a couple weeks ago where I asked, is where I suggested that we, with a bunch of economists, saying that I, I suggested that when economists write a byline for an op-ed or write a, um, uh, uh, you know, write a research paper, they should not include a disclosure that includes that they consulted for Google, but exactly how much money they made. So not, you know, Jan so-and-so has consulted for Amazon and Google, but Jan has received $50,000 from Google in the last few years, and uh, 
uh, $18,000 from AT&T, and the economists I was with laughed heartily <laughs> because $50,000 was seen as such a paltry amount of money. <laughs> More like $500,000, one of them said. <laughs> So this is corruption of academia and of thought on a grand scale that is a central part of the corruption that we are fighting in the indirect uh, forms of corruption. So what are the effects of this? One, radical inequality in the United States, which I know the best, uh, we have seen the richest 1% take in over half of the increase in income since the 1980s. Um, uh, intellectual revolution. We have seen radical um, increases in racial inequality, the destruction of black owned businesses. We have seen in the uh, communications sphere, both the destruction of local newspapers essential for a democracy and the dependency of journalists on Facebook, Google, and these central arteries of communication. We have seen a radical increase again since the 1970s in lobbying. It used to be tacky to lobby in the 1950s, a little bit déclassé. Recently, the big tech companies have spent some estimate up, up I want to get my trillions right, my, a billion, a trillion. <laughs> on, I'll get that number later on tech, uh, on lobbying on tech. And last year, $70 million the big tech companies spent on trying to stop just on lobbying, not on buying academics, not on all the other, just on lobbying alone, on trying to stop the uh, anti monopoly wave that is coming at them. And we have seen the growth of increased fear. So when Lena Kahn, who is now the chair of the FTC, was working with Barry Lynn, who I'm delighted to be here with, who's one of the real global leaders in the anti-monopoly movement, eight years ago, one of her first stories was about chicken farmers. And it's really important to understand that it was about chicken farmers who were not only robbed by the distributors, Tyson, who is taking as much money as it could in its governing role over those chicken farmers, taxing and extracting, sitting atop the industry. But it was also terrifying them. Because one of the real effects of this corrupting centralized power is fear. That the dependent journalist, the dependent chicken farmer, the dependent small business owner, the dependent worker who only has one of a few companies to work for, all of them are rationally afraid that if they speak up, if they use their theoretical democratic power, they will be hurt. So um, the, I'm really looking forward to the rest of this uh, conference and to the rejoining of the two parts of our global brain so that we first perceive mergers as political moments and stop as activists. I'm an academic, but also very much an activist at heart. Stop protesting Pfizer after the fact and start insisting that Pfizer should never be allowed to amass a form of illegitimate governing power in the first place. Look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Yeah. Uh Welcome from my side. Um, sorry for being an economist, <laughs> but uh, I receive no payment except the payment from my university. Uh, and my message here is uh, that actually I think uh, that the, I think the antitrust movement can gain a lot of insight and power from using mainstream economic research. Yeah? Um, and I think this will add a lot of credibility to the antitrust movement. Um, and so let me present a number of uh, facts on uh, uh, corporate power from mainstream economics. So corporate power versus competition policy developments, controversies, and perspectives from the US and the EU. Uh, I will 
um, ask three questions, which I hope to answer in some degree. Uh, at the end, has corporate power uh, increased? Is antitrust less stringent than in the past? And what is and what should be the goal of competition policy? Um, I have a lot of diagrams, charts, because once again, my aim is to put scientific, academic evidence on these three questions. Has corporate power increased? So when we talk about, uh, this is the only conceptual slide, yeah? when we talk about corporate power, this is actually a very complex topic when you want to uh, tackle it from an uh, analytical perspective. Um, the main thing here is that traditional antitrust and traditional economic analysis focuses only on one aspect, monopoly power. But as you can see, there are, another, uh, there are a number of other very important dimensions of corporate power, especially the interplay between economic power and political power. Right? Um, here, uh, Luigi Cingales referred to this interplay between economic and political power as the Medici vicious circle. Yeah? The two um, amplify each other. Um, I distinguish in my uh, research between market power, which consists of monopoly and monopsony power. So monopoly power is the buyer power, and monopsony, oh, sorry. monopoly power is the seller power, monopsony power is the buyer power, and scale power. Scale power is what we typically think about when we talk about corporate power, namely the uh, power that comes uh, because of the size of a corporation. Right? Market power, in its narrow definition, has nothing to do with the size of a company. This may be a surprise to you, but this is, this is one of the weaknesses when we only focus on monopoly power instead of considering the broader spectrum of the different types of corporate power. Some stylist facts on global corporate power. These are data from the recent publication, the most recent publication on this topic from the International Monetary Fund. Uh, first of all, we see here a global trend in markups from the 1980s through 2016, and we see an increase by about 30% in the global uh, markup uh, of corporations. What is the markup? The markup is the difference between price and costs, right? And um, we measure monopoly power by the size of the markup. The higher the markup, the higher the uh, market power of a company. Interestingly, this increase in the markup was mainly concentrated in the top D side of the uh, markup distribution, meaning those companies that already had the highest markups in the past were able to raise them by the largest amount, namely they almost doubled the markups, whereas the companies at the bottom of the markup distribution, so below the median, they raised the markups only by uh, several percentage points. In addition, we see here that the markup uh, persistence has increased, meaning the companies that had high markups in the past are increasingly able to retain these high markups well into the future. Right? So there is less churn in the markets, meaning uh, big corporations are more entrenched in their power positions. Um, on the bottom left, we see the concentration. Um, so the concentration refers to how much market share uh, 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 pertains to uh, a number of companies, for instance, four or eight companies. And we see that market concentration has increased by about 30% uh, since the 1980s, especially in the advanced economies. AE stands for advanced economies, EM for emerging economies. The profitability has increased as well. It uh, more than doubled in this period. And once again, we see it's mainly a phenomenon of the rich countries of the world. Business dynamics, which is another important indicator to measure market power or the competitiveness of a market, um, is here uh, measured by the entry rate. So how many companies enter, so how many new companies enter a market as a percentage of all companies in the market, and we see a downward trend. So there are less new competitors for the incumbent companies. Uh, so all the indicators uh, provide a very clear picture of an increase of global corporate power. Once again, mainstream research by the International Monetary Fund. When you consider markup developments in more detail, we see here at the US, 1955 through 2019, and we see here, uh, first of all, uh, um, that market power was much uh, uh, lower in the past, and we see then a very steep increase since the 1980s. Yeah? Uh, so this corresponds to Ronald Reagan, neoliberalism, and Chicago School of Antitrust. For Europe, I have here the newest study from the European Central Bank, Kuwavas et al. 
uh, we see that uh, also for Europe market power is on the rise. We have here the Eurozone and for the Eurozone as a total we see an increase of plus 15% uh, in the period 1995 through 2019 for Germany plus 26 percent. So this pattern of increasing markups holds not only true for the US uh, but also for Europe even though in general the evidence is stronger for the US than for Europe and for Europe we also have other studies so there is a kind of heterogeneity in the academic outcomes. Concentration developments, uh, once again, Europe versus US. We see here on the left side concentration ratio four and concentration ratio eight. This refers to the market shares of the four and eight largest companies in the market. Uh, we see that both are on the rise in the EU and in the US, in North America. Uh, however, once again, the increase is a little bit stronger for North America than for Europe. Yeah? Um, Pointing out the heterogeneity in the academic research on the white side, you see a finding from a study from the European Central Bank, which was a very important study at that time, which pointed out that, well, you see, there is no increase in concentration. So still there is um, this idea that Europe is different, the Europe is different hypothesis. This is still, uh, there is still some discussion about this, whether Europe really follows the same trend as the US. I would say uh, the uh, newer evidence says yes, but still there is some debate about the empirical developments in Europe. The political power of firms has also increased, although this is much harder to measure. This is the first uh, um, peer-reviewed study which shows the increase uh, of direct firm power, uh, um, uh, direct political power of firms. And here we see the lobbying context with the European Commission, and we see that the number of firms, the share of firms that had con uh, contacts with the European Commission out of a total has increased uh, from 29 to 44%. And these are numbers that refer to before the financial crisis and after the financial crisis. Yeah? Whereas on the other hand, the influence of business associations is down and the influence of NGOs uh, uh, declined as well. Yeah? So we also can observe an increase in the political power of firms, namely firms as such and not just business associations, which is even worse, I think. Why has corporate power increased? Um, there are two explanations, and these two explanations are important because the political implications are different depending on which explanation you accept. First of all, we have the very important superstar firm hypothesis, which basically says, you know, this growing firm sizes, this growing markups, growing concentration, this is all due technologies, new technologies, so networks effects, economies of scale, etc., etc., and we have merit-based market power. So the outcome is beneficial for society, it's beneficial for consumers, right? Because it's just the case that the more efficient firms grab larger market shares. And that's fine, this is what we want in economics, efficiency. However, the uh, 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 superstar firm hypothesis authors also say, well, now we need to be cautious because now the firms are dominant and now maybe they exploit the market power, right? But it says they have reached the market power due to merit. On the other hand, we have the political economic hypothesis, which basically says, well, look, lax antitrust enforcement is behind the increase in market power and concentration. And here, Robert Borg is perhaps the most uh, well-known author that may be behind this lax antitrust enforcement. Um, so he's one of the uh, founders of the Chicago School. And here is a quote from uh, Senator Metzenbaum from 1987. There was a hearing uh, because Mr. Borg was um, uh, a nominee for the Supreme Court by Ronald Reagan and Senator Metzenbaum asked or stated the following, um, you would accept total concentration of economic power in just a couple of companies, maybe three depending upon which day you were writing. Yeah? Uh, so Robert Borg argued that antitrust enforcement um, should be uh, changed, less strict, and so there are also strong arguments for the political economic hypothesis um, according to which lex antitrust enforcement is responsible for growing market power, for growing corporate power. Is antitrust less stringent than in the past? That's the second question I want to uh, address. Um, there are also a number of um, quantitative research studies on this. First of all, we see here uh, an overview from a paper uh, on antitrust cases in by the uh, Department of Justice. 
Uh, and as you see, you know, right in uh, 1890, the Sherman Act, and then uh, you see here an increase in the cases, so a more active antitrust um, policy. But then in the 1970s and the 1980s, we see a very strong decline in the number of antitrust cases picked up by the DOJ. Um, and, you know, uh, we have to recognize that these are absolute frequencies, these are absolute numbers, right? Uh, and the economy, of course, is growing over time. And so actually we would expect that the number needs to go up instead of declining in order to have the same level of antitrust enforcement. Yeah? So this is a clear indication that antitrust enforcement uh, has been weakened in the past in the US. There are some other indicators that show that the antitrust enforcement in the US faces several problems. First of all, resource constraints, increasingly strong resource constraints. So we see here on the left-hand side uh, budgets of the uh, Federal Trade Commission in the DOJ. And we see here uh, a time series that starts in um, the 1960s and then up to 2020. And we see between the 1960s and 1980s, there was a steep increase in the resources available uh, to the antitrust uh, authorities. But then since the 1980s, uh, there was actually uh, a, 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 no more, there were no more resources available. Yeah? So there was a constant availability of resources. And this, of course, was a problem, right? Once again, you have the growing economy, you have potentially more cases to tackle, more antitrust cases. And on the other hand, antitrust uh, enforcement became increasingly expensive, right? Because of the need for economic simulations, et cetera, et cetera. So this was actually one of the reasons why the Federal Trade Commission uh, um, had to uh, reduce their staff, especially in the economic department, by something like 50 people. Right? And this was exactly at that time where the Chicago School of Antitrust argued, well, we need a more economic approach. And exactly at this time, the agencies fired 50 economists right? um, because of resource constraints. Uh, on the right hand side, we see here the evolution of the Supreme Court's business friendliness. Um, so this is core, uh, um, um, which has been calculated based on the decisions of the, um, uh, of the judges in the Supreme Court. And we see here from 1960 up to 2020 an increasingly strong business friendliness. Yeah? So pro-business uh, decisions in the Supreme Court. Regarding the EU, what happened in the EU? So there is this very uh, uh, influential thesis that in the EU, the story is different regarding antitrust. Um, so we, hear, we see here data on regulatory trends. And this regulatory index here from the OECD basically depicts barriers to entry. So the higher the index, the higher the barriers to entry, the lower the competitive pressure. What we see is that for the US, uh, since 1998, there is almost no further reduction of barriers to entry, whereas for the European Union, all the countries here with the dots are the European Union countries, we see a steady decline. So in 1998, most of the European Union countries have higher barriers to entry, but in 2008, you see that most of the uh, countries in the EU have lower barriers to entry than the US, right? We see here the German case, and you see that the uh, relation between the two switched, and this is what Thomas Philippon calls the great reversal. Yeah? So now he argues that European markets are more competitive than the US markets. Um, here is a, a diagram which shows the um, merger cases picked up by uh, the DJ Comp as a percentage of total mergers. Uh, let's start with a, a number here. Uh, so since 1990, uh, there were uh, eight, uh, approximately 8,400 uh, mergers notified with the DJ Comp, and only 30 out of these 8,400 were prohibited by the DJ Comp. Yeah? Uh, so I think this is an impressive number, um, which points to the fact that, well, mo I mean, you, may you may argue that most of the mergers, they do not harm competition. Uh, but on the other hand, right, you have uh, a very strong force in our economy towards increases in concentration. Um, and interestingly, even though the main aim is to prevent the rise of consumer prices, on average, the mergers are followed by price increases, according to a study from the European Commission. There is very little information on how innovation and efficiencies develop after mergers, and this is crucial because most of the time, the parties who want to merge argue that there are phenomenal synergies in the future. 
but actually we know very little about the synergies and most studies, uh, most academic studies, which try to um, research this question, they come to the conclusion that the synergies are not there. Huh? Um, so in the end, uh, because of this rising concentration I've pointed out before, I'm, the monetary fund says there is a growing risk of under-enforcement and merger control. What is and what should be the goal of competition policy? Uh, the goals of competition policy has changed over time, and in some way we are now heading back to the past. Uh, so it all started with the Harvard School of Antitrust. Here the main, game, the main aim was prevention of monopoly power, right? like stated in the Sherman Antitrust Act and the Clayton, uh, Clayton's Act. Um, there was a structural presumption, namely that mergers in highly concentrated markets are bad. Um, sounds sensible, but this changed with the Chicago School of Antitrust. Here the consumer welfare standard was introduced. And the idea was we should only focus on consumer prices. And uh, the thing is, consumer prices can go down even if market power increases. Yeah? Why? Because of efficiency gains. Yeah? So suddenly, the prevention of monopoly power was not any longer the most important goal, but the most important goal was to uh, enable firms to become more efficient by becoming larger, and then some of the efficiency gains will be passed on to consumers, and so we now have large companies, but presumably, according to the Chicago School, they are more efficient. Uh, we now have currently a new mainstream, um, which says, well, protecting competition in output and input markets should be the new goal of antitrust. So they say we shouldn't depend on the consumer welfare standard, but we should broaden it. And on the other hand, we have the new brand eyes in movement, where it is argued that we shouldn't focus on outcomes such as consumer welfare, but we should focus once again on structures and processes, like at the beginning. So this structural presumption uh, should once again be uh, used by uh, antitrust agencies. In the European Union and in Germany, we have very similar uh, developments. So it all started in the 1950s with assuming we should have perfect competition, so small companies, bigness is bad. And then basically there was a divergence towards the uh, US concept of uh, consumer welfare standard. Final slide. Um, well, not the final side, sorry. At uh, the beginning of the end of the new Gilded Age, so there are some signs of hope. My colleague just pointed out some of these before. So we have Lena Kahn appointed to the FT FTC. Uh, a big merger was prevented between Alstom and Siemens. And I like this quote here, Elon, there are rules. Yeah? Uh, and uh, so this says, I think there is a new self-confidence on the side of the uh, competition authorities. And also in China, uh, there is a tech on there is an uh, attack on, on, on tech companies and um, there is a new uh, enforcement of antitrust new laws of antitrust in China final slide uh, my three questions has corporate power increased yes it has and not just in the US however there is no consensus regarding the interpretation of these findings COVID-19 is likely to amplify the concentration trends yeah? uh, is antitrust less stringent than in the past yeah, there was an erosion of standards and enforcement. Um, however, there are some signs of rising stringency. The EU competition policy seems to be too lenient as well, but pre presumably stricter than in the US. Uh, an important point, I think, for your activities is this lack of public interest in antitrust has facilitated the erosion of antitrust. I think this is an important point. Yeah? Um, there is an academic paper that stresses this um, finding. What is and should be the goal of competition policy? So the consumer welfare standard and market power are two narrow concepts, I think. Yeah? Um, so we should also include political power, buyer power, common ownership and distributional aspects. And finally, anti-monopoly policy is more than competition policy, much more. Yeah? It's also about regulation. It's also about, for instance, funding public universities that can provide solid evidence and so on and so forth. Okay, thank you very much for your attention.